As we let some more people in, I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, you can leave any comments in the Zoom chat in the Facebook comments or email us at programs at albemarlehistory.org. Um, send us any questions through the comments as we proceed with the program. And uh, any suggestions for any future programs, please let us know. Um, a few announcements before we get started. Um, this show is related to our most recently published magazine, the magazine of Albemarle Charlottesville history and the transcription of an oral history interview between Chick Moran and Paul Gaston that we included. Uh, my fellow host, Serling Howe, contributed the introduction and the in-note annotations for the article. If you are a member and haven't seen your copy, please let us know so we can check our mailing list uh, with the United States Postal Service as it is. Um, it may still be in the mail, quote unquote, but uh, better safe to check. So email us at info at albemarlehistory.org. And if you're not a member, uh, visit our website and uh, join and we'll send you a copy. Um, we are working with multiple partners during these interesting COVID times, one of which is the Front Porch, local music studio and live music venue. Um, they have gone virtual and online, and tonight they will be hosting Catherine the Great and Amy Andrews. Uh, this will be a live stream concert um, to support local music, and the proceeds uh, from that will benefit the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society. So support local music and local history tonight. Uh, we'll put some details in the comments in the chat uh, section for that information. And next week, um, there is a full slate of local activities and events to mark Liberation and Freedom Week or Freedom Days. Uh, the March 1865 anniversary of the emancipation of slaves in Charlottesville and Albemarle County when Union troops occupied the region. Um, I will be posting some links in the chats and comments for that. You can also check out the Jefferson School calendar on their website. They've got a brand new website up and running. It's pretty cool. Go explore it. Um, so enough with those announcements. Um, let's make some history. My name's Tom Chapman, as I mentioned. Here with Sterling Howe. Wave, Sterling. Say hello. Hello. Um, we are of the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society and would like to welcome you to Unregulated Historical Meanderings the Holding Up a Mirror to the South edition. This is our fourth unregulated, unstructured live show in which we invite some people or persons to join us with a casual conversation about things of interest to our friends here in the Charlottesville, Albemarle area and beyond. Our special guests today are Blaze, Chinta, and Gareth Gaston, the children of Paul Gaston, who uh, passed away just recently, actually, in 2019. Paul Gaston, Professor Gaston, was a renowned historian of the American South who taught for 40 years at the University of Virginia. And he was a celebrated civil rights activist who took part in a famous sit-in to protest racial segregation in 1963. Uh, Blaze, who's with us tonight, was born in England, or actually this afternoon, in England in 1953 and grew up in Charlottesville. Um, he was drawn to buildings at an early age and earned a BFA in 1975 from the School of American Crafts in Rochester, New York. In 1977, Blaze started a small custom furniture company that would become Gaston and Wyatt. Since 1992, Blaze has been building art, basically his furniture and unique cabinet work are, are, are pieces of art. And from 2003 to 2009, uh, Blaze was a the lead craftsman um, at, uh, for the restoration of James Madison's Montpelier. That's how I actually uh, met Blaze. He has also contributed to preservation efforts with his work at Monticello, Highland, UVA Rotunda, in addition to many private homes and businesses across the area. Chinta Gaston, uh, born in 1956, went to Venable, Jefferson, Walker, and Lane High School, earned a BA in linguistics from Radcliffe, studied law at UVA. She practiced law in New York City, including uh, for the U.S. Attorney's Office of the Southern District. She returned to Charlottesville in 1999 and became the general counsel and then chief legal officer of Logisticare, a company that manages non-emergency medical transportation nationwide. Chinta retired in November 2019 and is currently on the board of PVCC, otherwise is trying to lie low during the pandemic and enjoy relaxing. And Gareth, the youngest of the siblings was born in 1964. 
He earned a BA in philosophy, mathematics, and computer science from Swarthmore College. He studied doctorate level philosophy for a year at the University of Chicago. He lived in New York City for more than 30 years, working in technology and finance, uh, where he joins us actually today in New York. But he and his wife and daughter moved back to Charlottesville in 2019, where they have their home now. So welcome, Blaze, Chinta, and Gareth. Thank you very much for joining us. So Sterling, take it away. All right, thank you, Tom. And yes, uh, Blaze, Chinta, and Gareth, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I understand that uh, 2019 is not that far away. So I just want to start off by saying, I'm very sorry about your loss. And I really appreciate you uh, being willing to join us today and talk about your father. Um, to be honest, uh, I, I was unaware of your father before I started uh, working on this project. Um, but uh, I quickly found people who I was who I who, who knew him, uh, who had uh, taken classes with him at UVA and uh, spoke very fondly about those about those experiences. So I was just thinking for uh, any of our viewers today or anyone who's going to read the oral history in our magazine and um, did not know uh, of your father, I was wondering if each of you would uh, take a moment and just share something, something that doesn't come across in the oral history, something that um, maybe most people wouldn't know. Um, if uh, you could speak, uh, say something about your father as a as your father, or as a historian, as a teacher, as a civil rights activist, just something that you think um, would be important for everyone to know, and whoever would like to go first. Well, he saved my life when I was six, riding a bicycle down a hill, and with the brake, I couldn't make it stop, and I was embarrassed to say, I can't make it stop, and as I was about to go out on 29 South, he pushed me over into a ditch as the car went by that would have killed me. I bet you didn't know that about it. I did not, no. Very <laughs> great story. Um, Chinta or Gareth, have anything? Oh, gosh. I'm sure there are lots of things. He taught me how to spell cereal. I still remember <laughs> that. When we went to Baltimore, um, when I was seven in second grade, I was, uh, I guess, already kind of a type A personality, and um, I was worried I'd get behind my Venable class, and uh, for my first grade Venable class. So every Saturday morning, he gave me spelling lessons, and I can still see his handwriting, and I think it's pretty good that I could spell cereal in second grade. Um, but the other thing we did that was a lot more fun was we went to the Hecht Company, uh, which I guess we could walk to from our house in Baltimore. And we spent $100 every Saturday. Unfortunately, it was an, an imaginary $100, but it was good for my math. And we had, we had a ton of fun. And, you know, he was a real, he, he solved so many of my problems and other people's problems and adopted people and, you know, uh, Fixed, fixed their lives, but um, he was definitely a, a problem solver and he was very creative in the way he did it, um, including our spending $100 at the Heck Company every Saturday morning. So I bet nobody knew that, except Blazing Gara. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know that. Um, but he was an excellent speller and an excellent typist. He had a job typing yeah. at... Um, an early age at the Bank of Fairhope, and I was his. Com I introduced him to the computer and bought him a, or he bought, but I had him buy an IBM PC to switch out from his I IBM Selectric typewriter, and I showed him the spelling checker, and he was said, "I don't need no darn spell checker. I know how to spell," and he certainly didn't know knew how to spell a lot better than than either I did or or my mother. Um, but I remember he spelled supersede wrong. And it was like, he was still convinced the computer was wrong. And then we went and looked it up and darn it. Um, so, um, but then from then on in, I was his computer consultant and he would call me up to the office in the middle of the afternoon and pretend to have something to actually chat about before getting around to what his question was about why Microsoft Word wasn't working. Great, uh, thank you all for that. Um, so let's dive into the substance of the oral history a little bit. 
So the, uh, the events that uh, Chick asks her father about uh, start in 1957 and go up uh, into the, uh, the 60s. So, uh, uh, so Blaze and Chente, you were both very young and, and Gareth, you weren't even born yet when a lot of the events that took place uh, that they speak about in the oral history. So I'm, I'm curious um, how each of you became aware of your father's civil rights activities. Um, were these like stories that you just grew up with hearing over and over again, or was it different than that? I don't remember much. It must have been stories. I remember hearing about Patty Boyle and the cross burning very early on. And I just have a feeling that it was a very important, she was a very important person. And this was an important thing. But I don't ever remember it being told to me. I just have the memory of it. Um, one, one thing I wanted to just say that would maybe set a little bit of picture of what was going on. And in 1957, he moved here and he was on the lawn moving into his office in the end of August in a brutal hot day. And an uh, older professor came up to him and chatted with him and welcomed him to the university and then said, oh, and Mr. Gaston, a professor never appears on the lawn without a coat and tie on. And Daddy said, even on 95 degrees in August when no one's here? And he said, yes. So that was, it was different then in many, many ways. Um, the actual sit-in, I remember nothing of. I remember us putting the, uh, the telephone and wrapping it in pillows at night so that it wouldn't wake us up from all the nasty calls. Mm. What I don't know is why they didn't just unplug the telephone. I don't know what the technology was like back then. Because you didn't own the telephone. It was owned by the telephone company and it was hardwired. Is that what it was? Yeah, okay, so it was wrapped up in pillows so it wouldn't wake us up. I remember when the tires were slashed on the car, uh, all four tires were slashed by a UVA student. And I remember standing there the next morning looking at it and saying, just being astonished. Um, they caught the fellow and he was kicked out of the university for an honor violation. It was not for slashing the tires, but it was for lying about it and saying he didn't do it. Uh, that was one of our most interesting conversations when we were discussing the article early on. Yeah. We went to Fry Springs swimming pool uh, and loved it. And Mr. Detter kicked us out that summer. He didn't want any inward lovers in his swimming pool. Mm. So we didn't go to get to go to Fry Springs after that. Um, Uh, you want to say something, and I've got lots more we can talk about. Well, I remember putting the phone to bed every night, and I remember my mother making a sort of, you know, fun thing out of it. That it was time to put the telephone to bed. Uh, and uh, I don't remember the sit-in at all, um, or um, really much about the slashed tires, except there was something about some neighbor who didn't tell or, or say anything to the guy. And he said later that he thought he was just emptying, the, he was just letting the air out of the tires. And my father being very, you know, thinking that, that he was not uh, a good citizen, that to, what was the difference between letting the air out and slashing them really, uh, that he didn't report him. Um, you know, that guy is who, how, how we figured it out because he figured out who it was. What? That guy did figure out who it was. Uh -huh. eventually. I mean, from my perspective, you know, I've thought about it a lot. I didn't really understand that much about what it was about. I mean, except that to me, it was sort of a game of the good guys and the bad guys, and the good guys were the integrationists and the bad guys were the segregationists. And my parents were, you know, 
the good guys and as were others. And, uh, you know, it was sort of exciting to me. It wasn't scary. There were certain things you did. And um, I remember the women all putting lipstick on and when they put lipstick on, something was gonna happen. You know, they were, they were going to court or they were going to a sit-in or, or something, but there was this kind of frisson of, of nervous energy and the lipstick went on. Um, so, but I think it was, I mean, I, I guess I had some sense of there being a moral component to it, but um, not a very profound sense until I was, until I was older. Um, I mean, I'm sure I've told this story. I, you know, I kind of thought the Civil Rights Act was passed for me because I always wanted to sit up in the balcony of the Paramount. And I dragged Blaze down there as soon as the law was passed and tried to go up and darned if a security guard wouldn't let us. And you now I argued and argued with him and uh, told him there was a law that had been passed and our parent, and he said, well, your parents wouldn't want you to. And I said, no, my parents wanted the law to be passed. And finally he said, well, I'm not gonna let you go up there. And I was indignant. So you can see how I didn't really, you know, fully understand what the whole thing was about. Except that I maybe I could go up and I always sit in the Paramount and upstairs in the Paramount now just to get that security guard back. What about you, Gareth? You were the youngest. Uh, how long did it take you to realize what your folks had been up to those years before? I mean, telling family stories is something that I mean, he is a historian. And um, so, yeah, we heard I heard a lot of those stories. I don't think I'd ever heard about the cross burning or if I had it, I don't remember it but that was new but, um but wait but that he wasn't at that's the story that chick moran tells the cross burning at the meeting that was before yeah. my dad came but it um so no they, they were stories and to be fair I, they seemed like the olden times you know this to you know i went to venable and there were black students and there were white students and it didn't seem that just was the way the world was um so I thought you asked in one of the questions, you know, do, we, so do I see him more as an activist or a historian or a father? And I would put him in the teacher, historian, father category more than activist. So from my view, you know, growing up in a, you know, on Winston Road near the university, all friends were, my friends were all other university kids. You know, the people that came to the house were mostly university people. And um, so, um, did it, it ever, seemed like it's something that happened a long time ago. Right. Uh, did it ever feel like you had a different perspective on the world then than your, your older siblings having that dis, uh, distinction of not? No. no, no, we all were on the, I don't think so. You and, did like different kind of music. Yeah, I mean, we're quite, you know, we're, I'm, I'm a, good, <laughs> a good bit younger than them, but that, yes, yeah, so our difference was not about, uh, uh, politics or morals it was about whether you liked um the grateful dead or not <laughs> okay um i want to talk a little bit about venable um right. go ahead I, I went to venable starting in 1960 uh, there were no black students in my class i knew nothing about massive resistance i do remember classmates questioning me about whether I was a Yankee or a rebel. I didn't know what either of those were, but I learned quickly that rebel was the right answer. Um, and uh, we fought a war on the battlefield of the playground, and I understood it to be the Silver War. Uh, <laughs> Uh, which again, I knew nothing about, but we carried sticks and yelled things about the Civil War. Um, I have a letter that my father wrote. We just recently got a bunch of letters that he wrote to his parents in 1960, and there's some quite interesting parts in them. And he's writing about me uh, getting to go to Venable. Um, uh, Although we had hoped 
that one of the second grade classes, Negroes would be in Blaze's section. There are three second grade sections, but his class turns out to be strictly Caucasian. He has noticed the Negroes. There are 13 in the school and asked one day if Venable were a school for Negroes. It will be interesting to watch his reaction to those he does meet. Um, I didn't have much of a reaction. I, there were a couple of kids in my second grade class and I liked them just fine. And I didn't sense any tension and I would love to see those kids now and know what their thoughts were in third grade at Venable. Um, anyway, well, Blaise, I don't, I mean, I just, I had thought about that letter too, but I don't know if you were managed to decipher uh, mommy's letter Prior to that, it shows the difference in their personalities. She talks about having registered Blaze at Venable and that she was afraid it was illegal um, to register him. And she was afraid they would now be done for. Um, and then she said they asked the school board to let him go. And then and then she was afraid that there'd be pushback, you know, that, that they would be marked or something for having done that. I mean, I just, can you imagine what it would be like if you're African-American, if my mother was that nervous about- Well, we lived in the county and it was a city school. We had to pay tuition to go to city school. Yeah, but, yeah, but she was afraid that it was illegal and they were done for, for having done it. I mean, you know, she, she that's some pretty strong language and, and she was much more timid than my dad, but, uh, and then the school board voted, according to her, to allow the people living in that um, university housing to go to Venable uh, and to pay out of state, out of district tuition like they do now, which is still, you know, um, controversial. Uh, and then the story I've always heard, which isn't, it's not clear from that letter and maybe it's apocryphal, is that they applied to one of these segregationist kind of funds um, that had been set up to allow people who wanted to take their kids out of integrated schools to pay that out of district tuition. And that everybody who sent their kid to Venable applied for a scholarship. And so they were very, thought they were very clever that they managed to simultaneously give their children the opportunity to go to an integrated school and deplete the funds of the, <laughs> of the, um, and 250 I, bucks. I the letter, so, but I assume it's true. Or I was always told that. Yeah, it's all written down. Okay, it must be true then. <laughs> you know, and then I went a little bit later, but you know, again, it really d didn't make I don't have many memories of, um, well, I don't know if I had any black kids in my class or not. I do remember African-American teachers that um, came over from uh, Jefferson, I guess, and kind of being aware that this you know, that, that we should be good, we should be nice to them and not give them trouble <laughs> being instructed by our parents <laughs> that it was gonna be tough for them and we better be good. That was later, like fourth grade. I would like to um, uh, point out something in the oral history that I found pretty compelling. Um, there's a part where your, your father is talking about his decision to go into teaching history. And he, he describes it as he, he wanted to hold up a mirror to future Southern leaders. Um, Tom, do we have that audio? We can listen to Paul Gaston's own words. Can you see the screen share? Yes. Okay. Organization. So we came here in August of 57, and the political, racial turmoil that um, the state was in because of its determination to defy the Brown decision <clears throat> was on our minds. I, you know, it, it didn't occupy all of our time because here we were coming uh, 
uh, new job, new place, and all of these things. But it was of central importance because, you know, I had decided, maybe I should say this before we talk about what difference, uh, what, what I found in Charlottesville. When I went, when I made the decision to go to graduate school uh, in 1953, um, I made that decision because I wanted to find some way of playing a role in what I could see was the great crisis that the South was in and which crisis was going to get a lot worse. And so what kind of role could you play? Well, people said, uh, why don't you go into politics? Well, I couldn't have done that. Who in Alabama, that's my home state, who in Alabama would have elected me to office? I mean, anybody that had my views would never have got elected. Uh, could have been a lawyer, I suppose, but somehow that didn't appeal to me. Uh, might have been a journalist, but um, I just, I don't know why I didn't think about that. A lot of journal, many journalists played really creative roles in the civil rights movement. A lot of awfully good ones right on the front line. Might have been a preacher, some <coughs> preachers, <coughs> but not very many. But some played uh, very constructive roles, but, uh, <coughs> but the trouble was that I was a non-believer, so uh, I couldn't do that. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. So I'd majored in history in college, and it seemed like a good thing to do would be to uh, teach Southern history, and then try to find a job in a major Southern university, and teach Southern history to Southern men or women, if there were going to be any. It turned out the University of Virginia it was a long time before there were any women. But teach Southern history to the people who were going to be the, quote, leaders of the South, and sort of hold up a mirror to them and say, look, this, this is what your society has really been about. Wonderful things to it, but it's a deeply flawed society. Look at it, examine it. Is this what you want to continue? Have it continue to be in the future? So I became a historian, not out of any deep passion for history. I loved history, but it was not my sort of primary loyalty. My primary loyalty was to the region and to trying to to have find a way of playing some role. I found that found that part of the interview really interesting. Just thinking about his his thinking on what he wanted to do with his life. Um, and I was just wondering how each of you uh, react to that. What are your thoughts? Well, I can say that was exactly what I, how I thought, what I thought my dad did when he went to work every day. And um, I thought that, that, you know, once he got all those university students straightened out that we wouldn't have any problems anymore. And, you know, I'm exaggerating a little bit, you know, maybe the eight-year-old me or the nine-year-old me kind of thought that, but he was very um, optimistic. He was a, um, was believed in, you know, the goodness of humanity. And I think he felt if he could explain it uh, to people, they would change their minds and they would see the light and the world would be different. And um, to some extent, that was true. Um, not, but I, you know, I just thought he'd get that problem solved. I don't know, Blaze, did you? I, I, I certainly, I mean, I certainly ha heard him tell that story, you know, regularly and believed and like Chinta believed that's what he was you know, that was his mission. Um, I thought the conversation he has with Chick at the very end of the interview, I mean, he's, he's having this talk in 1988, so at the tail end of the Reagan years. And he's pretty despondent about whether he succeeded or not. I mean, he's, you know, they've, they've done the easy stuff. They've gotten broken down the legal barriers to, you know, um, Blacks going to school, Blacks and, and women going to UVA. And he goes on about how, but 
you know, they're, they all seem interested in making, everybody just seems interested in making money and um, not changing, not transforming society in any sort of radical way. And I think the degree to which he was a radical and as, a, as opposed to just the liberal is um, sometimes forgotten um, because he was so polite. <laughs> um, and, um, but it does, it, it is a sort of, the, that interview ends where he's a little sort of like, well, I'm not quite sure we've succeeded or there's so many of the kids don't know anything about the civil rights movement. And it sort of seemed to me at that point, he was more, now he was teaching history um, and less of a, um, he was less of an activist and more of a historian of activism by the, by the, by the late eighties or certainly by the time I um, was conscious of what he was doing. Um, and I sadly, I mean, he, his mind was pretty much gone by the time of uh, the, the unpleasantness here in Charlottesville and Black Lives Matter and the resurgence of the DSA and Bernie Sanders and, and Donald Trump, well, thankfully. But I've often wondered what he would have thought about all of that. I think he would have been invigorated by it and really excited. But um, I doubt he would have taken to Twitter. <laughs> Well, if you could have helped him with the technological aspects, he could have. So the Twitter gets awfully nasty in a way that I, I think he... Um... I don't know how people at that, of that generation, uh, particularly African-Americans, um, well, maybe they, you know, maybe it was more critical for them, but I don't know how they minded their manners. I mean, I find it hard to engage um, and I often just withdraw, but, but my dad didn't. He engaged every single day with people who were, you know, vicious racists and he was polite to them and yet, you know, didn't back down and, um, you know, I don't know if his life was at stake for doing that, but, but he, I don't know how they did it. And that comes through in the interview. He talks about the things about Darden that he liked and, um, and yes, and President Shannon, even though he never said anything about him getting beaten up. And um, the funny story that I, uh, if you, is it okay if I tell about? Yeah, go for um, it. So about I, was reading, I was reading a book about this book by a woman named Nancy McLean, who's a, a historian at Duke, I think, who wrote a book about um, economist James Buchanan, who was here at UVA at the same time as my dad. And um, I find, in, in, uh, and he's considered a founding light in the libertarian movement and the Koch brothers. And so she wrote this very critical book called Democracy in Chains and took a lot of heat for it from the Reason Magazine folks. And, um, and so, I'm reading the book and she thanks my dad in the, in the acknowledgements and she quotes his autobiography about the time in the 60s when, when they were fighting the, about the massive resistance. Um, and so I asked my dad when he's in, out at his nursing home if he remembers her and he has no memories. Memory's pretty shot at this point and he has no memory of her. And I asked, well, do you remember James Buchanan? He thinks for a second and sort of gets this one. Hmm. He was a son of a bitch. <laughs> um, and that's unlike him to, to say that. And so anyway, then I'm going back through and I have all of his emails are going on my computer. Um, I said I was his tech support. Um, and I find an email from Nancy McLean in 2008 when she's asking for help on her project. And, and he sends a reminiscence of James Buchan Jim Buchanan, and he calls him then, and said he was a nice sparring partner, that they had tea together at the university club, um, he was smart. Um, they both shared an interest in French wine and he brought back the list of French wines from Oxford, um, but that he believed the free market would solve all the problems and that, that he didn't need to do anything about segregation because the free market would solve it. And he said, oh, the economists, the economics department were just terrible. And so on the one hand, he just, you know, disagreed with these guys vehemently. and actually thought he was a son of a bitch when, you know, his, 
his defenses were let down in <laughs> um, stages of dementia, but- um, <laughs> The benefits of dementia. <laughs> right, right. Um, so, but, uh, but he could find, you know, something good about anyone, even people he really disagreed with. And, uh, Uncommon skill today. Yeah. Um, well, um, Chento, I want to bring up something actually from an email you sent me, if that's all right. Uh, you've, all, uh, you've all kind of touched upon this in some way, but I found this interesting. Um, uh, Chento, you wrote to me, I have various memories of my parents' involvement in the civil rights movement, all seen through the eyes of a young child mostly viewed as a fun game of good guys and bad guys and probably didn't really understand the moral significance. I did absorb the idea that racial integration was the answer to all society's ills. And I feel sad that A, it wasn't true and B, the kind of broad racial integration my parents envisioned never really happened. I was wondering if you could had anything more you'd like to say about that. And I was wondering if um, Gareth and Blaze, if you have a similar perspective on how things have played out since the days of your father's activism? Um, yeah, I guess that that, that uh, you know was sort of a naive view, but probably appropriate for the for the time. I mean, my parents were, you know, did believe that really strongly, and um, you know, made a point of of you know, wanting us to live a racially integrated life. I mean, one, one thing that a friend of my parents said to me recently, an African-American woman of their generation who was close friends with them at the time, I mentioned that I went to a private kindergarten because there was no public kindergarten. And um, I said, you know, I was surprised or, I don't know what I said, something about the kindergarten I went to. And she said, yeah, she said, I'm surprised you went there because there was an integrated kindergarten and your parents, you know, were so um, determined that every aspect of your lives that could be integrated would be. And I wish I could have asked my parents about it. I mean, it was only, you know, they were both deceased when I, but, but the fact that, that she viewed, you know, 50 years later or whatever them, as really caring about um, that, um, you know, comports with my view of, of what they, you know, what they cared about, um, and the importance of, you know, public school as part of being, you know, part of being in the community, and that you shouldn't send your kids to private school, um, and. Uh, you know, the businesses that you patronize. My mother went, she did her MA at, a, at Atlanta University, which is, was in, I guess, a, what do you call it? A historically black college or whatever. Um, you know, every aspect of our lives that was, and I don't remember it being anything except that's the way they wanted their life to be. It wasn't like we were doing anything for anybody. It was just, you know, um, and I guess I really did think that, that you know, if people got to know each other, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't hate each other. They wouldn't be afraid of each other. And, you know, and, and Bob's your uncle, everything would be fine. <laughs> um, you know, again, that's from the little girl perspective, but I still hold that in my heart as an important, you know, aspect of, of how it would be nice. I mean, one thing I thought is maybe we should just have tons of miscegenation. Um, maybe that would fix things, but. Um, uh, Do you have any memory of the, his reaction to Black Power, and Malcolm X and the sort of, you know, late, you know, the 1970s and later? I, I don't, I'm just was. No, I don't either. I do think he focused a lot more on Martin Luther King's you know, um, anti-poverty message at the end of Martin King's life and, and anti-capitalism and feeling like, you know, integrating the schools and integrating your life was not, was not a solution as Gareth mentioned and, and that there was a lot more um, that needed to be done to truly change 
society. I mean, he wrote a lovely op-ed on Martin Luther King Day some, I mean, not that long ago, 15 years ago or something, but basically saying you need to stop, you know, pretending that King is this, you know, colorblind liberal. He was a real radical and wanted to, I can't remember exactly, transform the fundamentals of American capitalism. Of course, I, I, um, you can find it on the web. You, I don't think it was, um, But maybe it's more a question of investing in the public sphere and being a member of your community. Um, there was really, people were excited about that, I think, at a certain time um, that we should have a, and now we've kind of uh, drifted into, well, I mean, one, once things were integrated, then lo and behold, the legislature didn't want to invest any money in all these public uh, goods that, um, previously were reserved to white people. I was just reading about all the public pools being drained, you know, once they had to be integrated. I think there's been a huge um, drift in our society to, I mean, UVA, isn't it much more funded by private money now? Mm -hmm. um, we have a million private schools in Charlottesville now. There's no longer, um, you know, as strong a belief in the public sphere and whether that's because of it, of um, the public sphere, you know, because of civil rights laws, I don't know. It's too that's above my pay grade, but it seems like it might be. Chinta, there's a comment that says, "I was your neighbor on Winston Road, Liz Hale." I have vivid memory. Oh, yeah. When African Americans came through and stayed at your house on the way to the March on Washington in '68, can you speak to that? I was four, so I don't, I can't. But. Wow, I don't, I don't remember, remember it at that. all. <laughs> Do you remember Blaze? No, I have no memory of that. I remember Liz, but no memory of people staying at our house. I mean, lots of people stayed there. Um, yeah, I mean, my parents, you know, unlike many people, bought a somewhat larger house after the three of us had all grown up and moved away. Um, and it was, you know, they hosted, there were a lot of guests. People came and stayed or worked for a researcher from Australia, came and lived there for a few weeks to work on his book and guests came and there were the, the number of people who have fond memories of staying with my parents is, 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 is very long. Uh, there was uh, another question in the comments. Um, can any of you speak about your dad's relationship with the Southern Regional Council and Julian Bond? Um, well, daddy, uh, we, in, when I was in ninth grade and right around 1970, um, we moved to Atlanta for a year and he was the research director for Southern Regional Council. And um, I think he, Southern Regional Council, I believe, is the oldest interracial group in the South. Uh, Research group. What? Research group. Research group. And they did a lot of voter education projects. I, I don't know everything that they did. I know they were funded by the Ford Foundation. They had quite a lot of money at the time. And um, I know he enjoyed that a lot because, uh, you know, he was with like-minded people and, and they had three martini lunches. I remember that, which my mom objected to. Um, and uh, um, then he stayed involved with them for years and years. And he used to take the train to Atlanta all the time. And he was president of them uh, on the, you know, of the board after he was no longer an employee. Um, they were, it was a very important organization to him. And Steve Suits, who later became the executive director, was you know, somebody my dad recruited and was a close friend. Um, I don't know if Julian Bond was on the board of that. I mean, of course, he was on the Southern Poverty Law Center. I'm not exactly sure how my dad knew Julian. Um, I know I, how we first met him. He was at a meeting at a somewhere and Julian was a young fellow and 
Daddy pointed him out to someone and said, who's that young man over there? And they said, oh, that's Julian Bond. That's, he's going to go places. So he, he figured it out before he met him that he was going places. And he became a good friend. And uh, the night Obama was elected, he was at Tinta's house, actually. We were all there watching the returns come in because he taught here at the university and he hadn't gone home, so Julian and Pam were we were with them the night Obama was elected and it was pretty amazing to watch his face when they finally called it. He had his cell phone up. He was just talking to people right and left. I believe he even shed a tear or two. <laughs> he might have. That was a that was a fun night. Too bad that uh, Obama didn't fix everything like my 10 year old self thinks somebody ought to do. <laughs> I went to a fundraiser in New York with my dad and Julian to try to raise money for his chair um they were trying to this i think they i don't know if, i believe they were finally successful or there is a julian bond endowed yes. chair of the history department it took a while though so yeah it did take a while i don't remember um but uh I have an african-american friend who really wanted to meet julian and so i took him to a speech at the university and uh then I got introduced and got their picture taken together. And years later, this man was having to go to court for some sort of infraction. And he said, do you think if I showed the judge that picture, they'd let me off? <laughs> I explained to him that no, they wouldn't. Uh, so you, um, you mentioned your father's reaction to uh, uh, to Obama's election. Um, did he have any, um, can you describe any reactions he's had to any more recent uh, of the troubling events? He yeah. was not really conscious, you know, he didn't really understand quite how terrible Trump was. Um, and he sort of, we tried to get him to come to some of the events after um, 2000 uh, after the the riots but he wasn't really up for it um his, his i asked him what he thought about our august 12th and he said i think people were behaving badly <laughs> <laughs> you know that and he couldn't really go any farther than that right but um the he was really not capable of you know his his dementia really um was creeping up for a long time. I think people don't often don't realize that. Um, you know, when somebody tells the same story again, you know, are they just being, you know, sort of egotistical and think you want to listen to it for the 57th time or do they really not remember? And I think a lot of it with him was he really couldn't remember. I, you know, I bet it was in the making for 10 years before we really, you know, knew what was going on. Um, and uh, well, this is sort of an aside, but they say one of the best treatments for dementia, anybody who thinks they might be getting it, um, is uh, to have somebody read to you about your life. And so I read him his autobiography over and over and over again. <laughs> and in the beginning, it would um, just calm him down. And, and But toward the end, he, he didn't know it was about him. And every once in a while, he would say, I think something like that happened to me. <laughs> yeah, or he'd re read me bits of it and say, do you know this, uh, this, is, this is amazing. Uh, for you did this or I did this. And he, yeah, it was, there was a, a very talented um, composer out at his home and she would carry around her sheet music or music that she'd written and had a little keyboard in her in her in her room and the two of them would uh um be clutching to their creations you know i think it was very sad well it's a good thing to have i mean you know uh to read i mean i think it was you know very very comforting to him in the end of his life so maybe everybody ought to write an autobiography that they can have their kids read to them once yeah. they've forgotten who they are yeah, yeah. but 
Um, I don't know what else. Uh, I think this question from P Patricia Bell is interesting, and and I don't know the answer to it. Uh, to the, to what extent should you know radical change be gentlemanly or civil or wouldn't it? I mean, the, the world's pretty terrible, and maybe we don't want to be so polite all the time. Um, I uh, don't know the answer to that question, um, but it's and I often wonder what you know the new activists would have thought of our dad when he had been what do you you know they thought he was an old-fashioned liberal who wasn't you know or, or or not i don't know yeah that is a good question um what what do y'all believe your father's legacy is in charlottesville and beyond i really think that's for us to decide <laughs> I have no idea. you know or maybe should I, how should, should I put it? What do you think it should be? What would you like to be the, the lasting memories of your father? No. I mean, I think he, the part you, I think it was you, you read, read it at the, or you had him say it at the beginning that, that, you know, for him, this is, he was trying to create the kind of world that he wanted to live in. I mean, it, it certainly, there's a certain kind of white noblesse oblige that it seems like you hear a lot now. Um, people, you know, sort of beating their breasts and saying, I didn't know it was this bad and I'm so sorry and I'm, I feel terrible about my white privilege and all of that, you know, all of which is true. But, but for my dad, um, it was a lot about him too. It, he wanted to be part of the solution. He, it was his South and he wanted the South to be a different kind of place. And, and it, so not only was it a sort of, you know, dare I say spiritual thing for my atheist father, but um, uh, for him, and, and he also believed that the, there would be a, it would be a much better economic or, or um, you know, on the civil side, sort of a healthier society that, that, that segregation um, uh, was bad for, for everybody. And, and, you know, I think the legacy should be he did what, you know, what, what he, everything he could, you know, for the time. Um, uh, and, you know, it was what, it was his dream, and he was living his, his dream of, of trying to make his home, home a better place. I mean, somebody asked about growing up in Alabama, um, he, you know, did grow up in kind of an unusual um, situation in that our great grandfather founded a utopian co colony in the late 1800s in Alabama, which was devoted to eradicating poverty and um, uh, was very um, uh, egalitarian. My dad did feel that race was the I don't know, we talk about slavery being the original sin of America. Race was kind of the, uh, you know, the sin that, that stopped Fairhope, the, the colony from, from growing or, or at some point, you know, tainted it. Um, and he felt very strongly about that. Uh, so, um, he grew up as a, you know, he was a utopian. He believed in, in, the, in, in that um, the goodness of people, and he believed it was possible to live in a utopia, and he wanted to play his part in it. I've got yeah. one thing I remember to read from a letter that talks talks about uh, something that I had no idea. Um, just when the, this is 1960, just when the Democratic Convention began, I could listen to a good part of it with clear conscience. I'm still skeptical about the outcome far from enthusiastic over Kennedy. Of course, when I think of him as the alternative to Nixon, I'm ecstatic. Such are the choices one must make in politics. I'm afraid I was a weepy Stevenson to the end, despite his shortcomings in recent months. With Kennedy now the head of the party, I find myself in a very strange and new position. This is the first time in my life that the leader of the Democratic Party, 
has not been a person who roused my emotions, made me feel here and great man. For a long time, of course, I thought FDR was the only president of the US ever had, but then came HST and AES, and I could, in one way or another, idolize these. Now the old idols are gone, and it's a funny feeling. It was fascinating. Yes. Uh, I, I never knew this about him. I never knew that he was not <laughs> wild about Kennedy, and I would love to know how he changed his feelings along the way. But he, he had idols and heroes. I don't remember. I mean, Carter is the first president I remember being elected, and I remember we were excited that the Democrat won, and it's only later that I've sort of read just how conservative Carter was, and, and I'm sure they knew that but I don't remember him talking about it so much. Um, I remember we were all very excited about it, but uh, um, I remember him saying, it, he was at a speech that Carter was giving in Atlanta and Carter said something about, you know, after the civil war, you know, so many people or most people were upset about what the North was doing in reconstruction. Um, I, think, I don't think he did it publicly. I think he went up to Carter afterwards and said, you know, you might want to rethink that. Not most people were not actually upset about what the North was doing in reconstruction. Most people were pretty pleased about it. And you know, should have said most white people and he, Carter was horrified and at least, um, no, no. And he did have quite an ego. I remember him watching Carter make speeches, just to be sure he didn't make that mistake again. And every time Carter didn't make that mistake, he took credit for it. He did like to tell the same story multiple times, <laughs> I, I, even before he had dementia. Right. But uh, were there any other questions we needed to address? I think we're about out of time. Um, Somebody asked about our, our mother. Yes. And we probably don't have long you know, so yeah, she was extraordinary. And um, I think she, in many ways, radicalized in her retirement. You know, she got very excited about, I mean, she was working hard for Virginia organizing, um, the living wage campaign, um, uh, I think 2008. And, really radicalized her a bit um and she was more explicitly anti-capitalist i think right um and and more willing to do the sort of foot soldiery kind of stuff that you'd had to do to go down to virginia organizing and write letters and um things that were perhaps not as um prestigious, I don't know. Um, but, um, but yeah, she was extraordinary. And uh, I continue to meet people who were like, oh yeah, my mother, my mother took me in at, at a difficult time. Any? Definitely, any? they came from very different backgrounds. My mother was a minister's daughter and uh, my dad was brought up an atheist, but an atheist because of religion having, um, ba being racist basically. Um, uh, you know, it wasn't, he wasn't just kind of a casual atheist um, <laughs> and yet they shared their, their, you know, political slash moral view of the world, so. Well, to answer Robin Jones's question, absolutely not. That is one of the, I've, I've met children of activists who were, you know, they're having to bail their, you know, go get their parents out of jail or worried about the police coming in the middle of the night. And, you know, our dad, both of our parents were always there for us 100%. At least I feel that way. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, when Martin King came to UA in the summer of 63, Eddie went out to the airport and picked him up and brought him in. It, but our mother brought Trent and me out to the airport to meet King. And I, I, I already, 
I already knew he was an incredibly important person and he managed to shake my hand in a way that was extraordinary. Uh, I'll never forget that. I didn't wash my hands for two days after that. I was nine years old. <laughs> it was an extraordinary experience. Yes, I remember it too. I didn't wash my hands either. <laughs> Somebody told us not to wash our hands. Was it? We didn't get. We didn't get that idea ourselves. Hmm. I never liked washing my hands anyway. So. <laughs> Just to point out the question that uh, Gareth was asking was, did the children ever feel like their parents paid more attention to their activism than to themselves? Uh, did they feel sort of changed? So I just wanted to- No, no absolutely not. You didn't, uh, don't have the ability to see that in the chat on Facebook or anything. Sorry, I didn't, didn't read the question, but no, no. No, that's fine, that's fine. Um, I greatly appreciate your time here. Sterling, do you have any- uh, additional thoughts. I thought I might like have Paul kind of talk us out with another snippet from the oral history and then we can uh, conclude. Thank you. Thank no, you. I, I've got nothing. I would just like to say, that, yeah, thank you very much for joining us today. That was, that was, that was a great discussion. Thank you. Uh, I see a lot of my students in my Southern history class, uh, women and men, wonderfully open, inspiring students, years beyond, I guess, the students that I taught 20 years ago, um, anguished about the state of the world and the kind of students I hoped I would teach, you know, uh, really open to uh, growth and new ideas and wanting to see what the world is like, but not really knowing what it's like or how to get a handle on it so that in one sense, the issues today are so much more unclear because so many successes, because we've had so many successes in tearing and opening up doors and tearing down barriers and resolving the issues that the students of 20 years ago or 20, 30 years ago saw so clearly as being the issues, either the things to be defended or the things to be attacked. Back when the issues were very simple, those things, those problems have been largely solved, but so all the scaffolding around this world where power and privilege is unequally distributed and where racial discrimination exists, well, all the scaffolding is gone. But now the corpus that's still there has its, has its uh, legacy or has its um, uh, remnants. I mean, the, the effects are still there. The students and the rest of us today don't quite know what to do about that. And uh, it's, um, it's a much more complex problem. And it won't do to deny its existence. On the other hand, it won't do to explain it in old-fashioned terms. I thought that was a very good uh, kind of synopsis, I guess, with, with Mr. Aston kind of speaking to... Uh, the complexity of, I guess, re referencing 1988, but uh, I think still also relevant to our modern day in terms of how we wish we were a, a 10 year old Chinta and, and it's all good guys and bad guys. And we can, you know, find, uh, find the, uh, um, you know, find the white horse and run off into the sunset. But uh, there's a lot of complex and nuance and uh, Professor Gaston definitely understood that. Um, so I want to thank, uh, the, the, the Gaston children here, uh, Chinta, Blaze, uh, Gareth. Um, and I also want to say I, I definitely have empathy in terms of understanding uh, Professor Gaston's later years, uh, grandparents who dealt with dementia for uh, the better part of their last decade. And uh, it's, not, it's not something to you want to have uh, good memories of your father and, and and remember him in, in ways that are, you know, when he was there and not uh, think about the past like that. But uh, just wanted to simply say that. Thank you. So I think uh, unless uh, you all have anything else to mention or, or talk about, uh, we're going to close it out here. Thanks so much. Have a good thank day. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Thanks, Sterling. That was great. All right. Yeah. All, all right. right. So all of us out there. Uh, 
If you have any ideas for future guests or future topics, please let us know. Uh, don't forget to mark your calendars for next week with uh, Liberation and Freedom Days. Um, you can find all this information on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube. Uh, remember, uh, everything we do as your historical society is uh, because of your support. So uh, please support your local history, your local historical society. Unregulated Historical Meanderings is brought to you by the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society and wonderful supporters like you. Uh, thanks again to the Gastons for joining us today. And thanks to everyone out there for joining us for your lunch and supporting what we do. I'm Tom Chapman here with Sterling Howe, and we hope to see you on the next Reg Unregulated Historical Meanderings. Until then, meander on. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Okay,